Experimental archaeology is a field of archaeological investigation that uses experimental simulation and reproduction of archaeological processes in order to test hypotheses that have been derived from the clues that are left to us by the archaeological record. A key aspect of experimental archaeology differentiating it from reenacting or simple recreation is the need to collect systematic and detailed data aimed at answering specific archaeological questions. It is crucial that experimental work be both reproducible but also as realistic as possible to the conditions that would have existed in the archaeological record. And the way that we do this is through careful control of variables. The Department of Archaeology here at Newcastle University has got a strong research strand in material culture also promoted by our SIAS, the Cluster for Interdisciplinary Artifact Studies, and our Wolfson Archaeology Laboratory. We, as PhD students interested in uh, culture material studies, were brought together by the use of experimental archaeology as a tool in our research, and so decided to create the first experimental archaeology research group here at Newcastle University. Newcastle University played a role in the development of experimental archaeology, specifically archaeometallurgy, with the work of Professor Talcott, an engineer and metallurgist interested in the history of ancient metallurgy. Our aim is to establish a long-term research group which is able to carry out experiments relevant to the research of its members. We recently established a collaboration with Jarrow Hall Anglo-Saxon Farm and Museum, which has now become the home of Exxon's experiments and provides us with an excellent opportunity for student engagement and public outreach. We believe experimental archaeology is crucial to help connecting academia with local areas and wider public. For this film, we have chosen two case studies from our ongoing projects focusing on two of the earliest inorganic materials used in the archaeological record, stone and metal, in specific copper. Stone tools were used by people for centuries before the advent of copper and bronze. They are present at most archaeological sites and take up a large space in every museum collection. Yet, for many types of stone tool, little is actually known about their function. For example, stone battle axes and axe hammers from the early Bronze Age. Previous interpretations have assumed battle axes were non-functional symbols of power, of the elite and exclusively ceremonial. Whilst the cruder axe hammer is thought of as neither being too large and too crude to be thought of as prestigious or functional implements. This is my replica battle axe. My project uses experimental tests and analysis of the wear formed during these tests to better understand the use of these objects. The wear marks on the experimental tools were compared to the wear marks on the battle axes and axe hammers in museum collections, which has allowed me to understand the use of these objects and prove the stereotypical assumptions wrong. Due to the extraordinary wealth of its ore deposits, Cyprus was the metal powerhouse of antiquity. Most of the copper traded and used in the Mediterranean from the Bronze Age to the late Roman period was sourced from and smelted on this island. The importance of Cypriot ore mineral deposits has led to a wealth of research on prehistoric copper mining and production. However, this has overwhelmingly concentrated on provenance and exchange studies via the isotopic fingerprinting of ores and ingots at the expense of other research strands. My research intends to reconstruct the complex series of actions, gestures and technological processes that were involved in the ore processing, smelting and casting of Cypriot copper during the early Middle Bronze Age through a combination of archaeological, analytical and experimental work. The research is based on the evidence from Pyrgos Mavroraki on the southern coast of Cyprus and the modern district of Limassol. 
This early 2nd millennium BC settlement site was excavated by the Italian National Research Council from 1998 to 2012. The complex yielded a great deal of metallurgical installations and residues, including ore roasting beds, smelting and casting furnaces, slugs, crucibles, blowpipe nozzles, molds, anvils, metal working tools and bronze artifacts. Experimental tests for stone battle axes and axe hammers were based on the hypotheses of use created through wear analysis of those in museum collections. The first experiment was to test for a land clearance roll. The experiment used a replica battle axe to dig earth and chop through roots. <sighs> 500! Each replica is hafted using an ash or pine haft. After the axes have been hafted, they are placed in water to secure the axe to the haft. No. We have to re-haft it. This does happen. Wooden wedges are also used to help secure the axe. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> Ready? Bashed up quite a few roots there. <laughs> the first stage of preparation for the experiment was building a model of one of the copper smelting furnaces from Piergos. This type of furnace is known as a bowl furnace, a common type of smelting furnace for copper in early metallurgy. Yeah, it could still be. 22 centimetres depth. So we want to go a bit further. Uh, and the soil is really different. Because the soil of Jaro is very different from that on Cyprus, we created an artificial mix, adding limestone to the existing soil in an attempt to better mimic the original context. The furnace was constructed by first excavating a small bowl-shaped hole in the ground, approximately 30 centimetres in diameter and 20 centimetres in depth. This was then lined with the soil and limestone mixture and a rim, 10 centimetres in height, produced from clay was added around the top edge of the structure. Similarly, an open pit fire was constructed and lined with limestone. This roasting bed was used to prepare the copper ore for smelting. I have hypothesised a woodworking role for many stone battle axes and axe hammers in the archaeological record. I carried out an experiment to test this hypothesis. The experiment used a replica stone battle axe to remove pine branches with a chopping motion. During all experiments, pauses were taken at specific points to record the effectiveness of the experiment and also to take casts of the blade of the axe. Casts were taken using products such as acetate and provil, which is a silicon-based casting product. These replicate the surface of the tools, and this means we can actually analyse them at a later date. You've got mainly uh, two copper ores used in antiquity. This is charcoal pyrite with this bluish effect, copper, sulfur and iron. While this is a carbonate, malachite, it's really easy to smelt. Charcoal pyrite needs an additional process of roasting. Uh, we need to run a bonfire for several, several hours. Yesterday we ran six hours. We hope to do the same today, maybe a little bit more. But before we will crush the semi-roasted mineral to extend the roasting right. surface, the oxidation surface. We're now running the roasting. The two crucibles. Yeah, and four logs. We constantly feed the bonfire and we regularly check the temperature through our thermocouple and so try to relate the temperatures with the actual effects that they will have on the physical status of charcoal pyrite. After this phase, uh, charcoal pyrite should be ready 
to be actually smelted. Roasting, RST, yeah. one. So after the second set of roasting, you can see that this is basically just going to powder as we're crushing it. This powder is coming from the interior of the, um, uh, of the lump. That powder is red, which means that it's oxidized all the way to the center um, of the ore. Brilliant, I would say. I am taking a sample from the roasted mineral, looking for fragments of, of mineral. First of all, I will analyze their composition in order to see if the ratio between sulfur and copper changes. And then possibly I can mount them in uh, resin and uh, look at them through the um, scanning electron microscopy, make some analysis. Okay. What was that? I carried out four other experimental tests using replica battle axes and axe hammers to understand the use and functionality of these objects. Two experiments were carried out with axe hammers. One of them was as a wedge to split wood with the aim to split it into planks. This did not occur and thus it informs us on the types of possible uses for these objects. The other experiment tested the axe hammer as an object to slaughter animals. Two further battle axe replicas were used in another two experimental tests. One was to split wood into smaller pieces to be used as firewood. This was used with a chopping action and was highly successful. 23 hits. The other experiment was using a replica battle axe to dig earth full of stones. This experiment was carried out to compare with the experiment I carried out digging earth and roots. It is important to carry out similar experiments to understand whether their outcomes are also similar, whether the wear on both objects is similar, and whether they act the same when they are used. We've got some nice scratches In here. this case, there were no similarities. The results of the experiments proves the assumptions that these objects were non-functional is incorrect. They were actually highly functional objects. Are you trying to see if it's actually perforated? That's strange though. When you have the chance to experience in first person the hypothesis uh, that you want to test, well, I think it's a, the research goes on another level. At 10.38, we lit the fire into the pit furnace. Okay. After drying and warming up the furnace, we charged the crucible with 50 grams of crushed, roasted ore. So that's crucible <coughs> number one. We placed the crucible in the middle of the furnace, covering it with pine wood charcoal. Yeah, we really need another one now, that's it. Oh, we air elemented the furnace using blowpipes with ceramic nozzles based upon those found at Piagos. This is a sort of stone holder which has been found um, at the excavation of Piagos Mavroraki and it has been found with a nozzle inside it. Yep, so we're trying to extract the metal from the ore at the moment. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we're trying to reach 1,200 degrees. I've got pipes. Using the blowpipes proved to not be an easy task. We found the most efficient method was to blow in succession with each person blowing into the pipe immediately after the previous operator to their right finishes their breath. We're getting the temperature on the bottom. In this way, each blowpipe operator had long breaks between each breath. This allowed us to keep the smelting process going for the required length of time, keeping the flow of air constant 
and thus more easily reach and maintain the target temperature of around 1,000 degrees Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> well, Marco, you've been pleased to know it's reading 1138. 1138? Yeah. I honestly didn't expect to reach the temperature so soon with the just blow pipes. I'm really curious to check if we actually managed to obtain some copper from the charcoal pyrite because this is what, uh, what really we're looking for. The stone replicas used in my experimental tests were analysed under a microscope to interpret the formation of wear from use. Types of wear include pits caused by the removal of stone grains, scratches or striations on the stone surface, the rounded appearance of stone grains, and also polish, which can develop as shiny patches on the stone surface. The wear formed on many of the experimental replicas are comparable to the wear that I analysed on battle axes and axe hammers in museum collections. By using experimental archaeology, I have been able to understand how stone battle axes and axe hammers in the museum collections were used. And we still have to wait for it to dry. There are mosquitoes. Yeah, we learned that when we got here. <laughs> oh, yeah. So some of it is well slagged, and this certainly looks pretty <laughs> copper bearing. Six smelting trials have been carried out, both using just charcoal pyrite and a mixed charge of charcoal pyrite and malachite. At the end of each experiment, the crucible and its content have been sampled for macroscopic, microscopic and chemical analysis. A group of very, very small preels. The main aim of the experiments was to test the efficiency of the blowpipe's bowl-shaped furnace smelting technology and to match the slugs experimentally obtained with the ones from the archaeological record at Pyrgos. To do so, the samples will be mounted in resin and analysed under the optical microscope and the scanning electron microscope coupled with an electron dispersive X-ray detector in order to compare the mineralogy and composition of the slags. So far, coarse smelting of chacoparite and malachite proved to produce copper more easily under the conditions that we tested. But further trials of chacoparite smelting will be carried out as this seems to more closely match the evidence from Pyrgos slags. Where do you find copper from? It's, it's a little bit of a magic. So very long, very long, long. It was a very primitive phase for Cypriot metallurgy. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hope it works. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Materials research, it's a really vital part of archaeology, but it's also one of the easiest ways, I think, to really connect people, because it tends to involve things like fire. It's an exciting element to it, transformative. There is an element of it that goes beyond the physical realm into this sort of magical, spiritual, magical realm. Alicia, would you like to sit down? Please. <laughs> Wait a second, I... <laughs> that nozzle is the right thing. <laughs> is that possible?